Tim, we're back. We just talked last week on strength training protocols, and now we're going to get into strength training nutrition, which is interesting because I'm not sure many people would know the difference. So right off the bat, what is it? Yeah. So let's go back to building muscle. Muscle is just a fancy storage for glycogen. And when we're thinking about neuromuscular adaptation, let's talk about what actually happens at a, a cellular level, glycolysis. And glycolysis is a breaking down of glucose. And one of the things that happens during glycolysis is a means to get more ATP. So glucose enters the cell, goes through a series of steps in the glycolytic pathway that gets to the end result and has two fates. If there's oxygen present, it gets converted into acetyl-CoA and that enters the mitochondria and that goes through the citric acid cycle. Remember, never call it the Krebs cycle because Hans yep. Krebs stole that idea from, oh my God, do you remember the guy Rob told us that he stole that? This goes into the, some. I think it was some Russian name, yeah. Krangi or something like that. Either way. You remember that Krebs is a liar and a thief. So. Yeah, Krebs is a liar. Yeah, never, never call it the red Krebs cycles. If you do, you're not showing the just due respect. Uh, and then electron transport chain, ETC, which pumps out 36 ATP, depending on what text you're reading. That is with oxygen. Now, most strength training is or get, with the attempt to get stronger is anaerobic without oxygen. So that will go to the other pathway of going to become lactate and lactate leaves a cell become lactic acid and then that hopefully goes to the, the liver because through the core cycle produces more atp but the idea is all of this is off the pretense of working in glycolysis right shorter sets less oxygen per set working to type 2 muscle fibers which are going to be fatigable more fatigable right so we're thinking that the the type 2 muscle fibers are not as mitochondrial rich and don't have the capacity to go through the natural oxidative pathway and they're going to get fatigued faster and produce more lactate and produce more lactic acid because of it. So right off the bat, you're thinking, okay, well, how do I support anaerobic glycolysis pretty simple have more glucose and this might come at the the thought of like well i heard glucose is bad because you can get fat and sugar is bad like we're not talking about getting fat are we we're talking about producing more force right well we're trying to give the foundational piece to getting stronger right and that's the part that i think is so fun about all this is like oh man i heard such and such was bad i heard such and such was this like well you know it's funny biochemistry and chemistry still exist and thank god that we have that because that truth is true and your truth is conditionally true and that's the part that's amazing about well damn i'm glad i went to undergrad and i got a degree in this and i'm glad i got a master's degree in this and i'm glad i spent countless hours learning chemistry and understanding understanding essentially bioenergetics because I can go to that person like, well, I want to get stronger, but I want to lose body fat. So I told carbs are bad. It's, it's a pretty simple cause and effect relationship. If you have the prerequisite fuel to produce more force through contractile units, you'll be able to do it. And, oh man, I heard creatine was bad, which, all right, well, I'm going to cycle through ATP quicker and, the more creatine phosphate I have available, the better I have a position to regenerate or replenish ATP faster because that's what creatine phosphate's primary role is. And I can produce more force, right? I can get another rep or I can produce more force at a certain intensity than someone else. That's usually wins out. But it gets into this like notion of you almost got to like detach, right? Like we're, we're carpentmetalizing getting stronger. Like that's the only thing we're looking at. And for a thought experiment, and I, I want everyone who's listening to this, and if you're, hey, I just want to learn about exercise science and strength conditioning, you know, just detach from your goals for a second, detach from what you've heard and all of the other nonsense that is talking in absolutes, but they're very conditionally specific in things or anecdotal, which isn't the end. Like, I don't hate anecdotal because 
the foundation for research is anecdotal, right? We don't learn, we don't have any interest in finding out more and proving something is true or untrue until we have some sort of anecdotal observation, right? The fact that we know ulcers are probably from H. pylori and the fact that someone drank H. pylori and basically got it, gave himself an ulcer is anecdotal and that starts a whole bunch of other research. The same thing with bacteria. Everything else is like, I mean, we can look at the polio vaccine as like, you know, anecdotal and then it got researched. Like everything starts in that level. But if we're looking through now, the what we're trying to do with just simply getting stronger and detaching. We talked about weight loss. We talked about muscle gain. Now it's time to talk about getting stronger, producing more force or higher rate of force development, whether it's through absolute strength or relative strength. But the notion of glucose being stigmatized in any way is not the goal here. It's looking at this saying, all right, I'm going to go through anaerobic glycolysis. I have more glucose available to Basically, by default, I should have a greater capacity to produce force throughout a workout or within an individual set. When I'm deficient in gly- glucose, I'm going to be deficient in glycogen and, or I'm reduced glucose and glycogen. I don't have the prerequisite energy. And ketones just simply ain't going to cut the mustard here, right? It's just not. You know, ketones are probably better for more oxidative, right? That's more mitochondria and more of the fact, which is great for brain tissue, but not necessarily for muscle tissue. Oh, like I heard you can, I heard you can get put on incredible amount of muscle mass doing keto. Like not the goal of that, to be honest, and definitely not the, what you should be thinking about if you're trying to produce a high amount of force or whether it's absolute or relative. So glucose is the foundation and glucose comes from sugar, right? Glucose is a monosaccharide, meaning that's a simple sugar that comes from basically table sugar, or there's a lot of other single, single monosaccharides or glucose molecules out there that you can get from nature, like fruits and other things. But as a whole, the more glucose you have in your body, typically you have a better potential to produce more force. And if your goal is to get stronger, you should be thinking about where's my glucose coming from. There's a point of diminishing returns and we'll go through how that's going to impact insulin and can impact actual blood sugar and other things like potential force output later in a workout. But the note is... All right, let's just start with glucose. And then there's amino acids, which preserves glucose. That if I don't have a lot of glucose, or if I'm utilizing ATP at a high level and I start to burn through glucose through glycolysis, that if I have more amino acids, specifically leucine, then I'm going to have a greater glucose preservation, and then I'll have a greater capacity later, which above all else is the foundation here. It's thinking about glycolysis, it's thinking about what's going to enhance glycolysis and what's going to preserve glucose to keep enhancing glycolysis as we go. That's the central theme. So just keeping those glucose stores tied up, using that as efficiently as possible. We also talked Mm -hmm. about a neuromuscular component to uh, getting stronger. Are there any things we can do nutritionally to support that aspect of getting stronger? Nervous tissue or CNS prefers glucose over ketones. If it's available, they'll take glucose every time, every time. I mean, that's just the truth. And, it's not until we deplete glucose that has to find an alternate energy stores. Now, the it's a very, very simplistic way of doing it, but ketones are a cleaner fuel. Like, well, it, glycolysis is expensive. Glycolysis has a lot of byproducts. And specifically, if you're doing anaerobic glycolysis, it's going to produce a lot of hydrogen ions, which is generally turning your body acidic, which is, if that's the goal, like, I mean, growth hormone, testosterone are typically triggered by acidic cellular health. Like, that... Because it's thinking I got to handle anaerobically because it's what seems what we like to do. So building in more tissue or contractile units to be able to do that better in future is a nice evolutionary adaptation to this. So if we're thinking about glucose versus ketones from a neuromuscular aspect, and I heard ketones are just more efficient. Absolutely true. But the problem is, is not really the preferred preferred actual actual thing. And one of the things of why we're hardwired to find very, very hedonic nutrient or energy dense, not nutrient dense foods is because it's always been scarce and our nervous system, muscular system prefers. So if I need to procure food or evade a predator in some capacity, chances are I want to have as much high energy yielding foods quick energy as possible 
And now we translate that to artificially doing that through strength training and sprint training and plyometrics and things that are supposed to improve our neuromuscular efficiency. It's still going to come down to glucose. Now, there's a caveat to all this. People who are insulin resistant, early on pre-diabetic, high HbA1c, they're probably not going to utilize that glucose as efficiently as someone with a lower body comp and a lower HbA1c and then potentially more insulin sensitive. Now, that gets into that we need to increase their body comp, we need to increase their, their overall metabolic health. But that aside, the neuromuscular system is always going to prefer glucose over everything else, specifically ketones. When we're thinking about producing force and trying to create both neuromuscular and and muscular adaptations to produce more force, the foundational piece will be simple sugars, specifically in the form of glucose. And when we're trying to game up that workout or trying to tie up, all right, hey, what is my goal of this workout is to try to get 10 sets of three and 90% with the 3 exo tempo with a three minute break in between sets that my ability to get to sets seven, eight, nine, and 10, or in this case reps, what's that? 24 through 30 is going to be premised off of what is my glucose levels with my creatine phosphate levels, what's my amino acid levels and my ability to go through anaerobic glycolysis later. And if I'm overly acidic and I'm not, allowing for enough recovery, or if I don't have enough prerequisite energy and I don't have enough glucose to enter the system, I'm probably not going to be as good as I could be. And you'll see that come in the form of a couple of different things. One, I'll alter my range of motion to accomplish a task. I will alter my center of mass to accomplish a task. My rate of force development will go down. The overall execution of that blue bit will be deteriorated and that's a diminishing returns, which gets into this aspect of this outcome of Hey, when I hit that brick wall, what do I do? Right? The, the hitting the wall. And there's an idea too from in the running community called central governor. And I think a lot about central governor. It's created by Timothy Noakes. It's the, it's kind of like the final evolution of Han Sally's general adaptation syndrome. And then Bannister's not Roger Bannister, but the other Bannister's fitness fatigue theory. And then it gets into Noakes of, you know, that adaptation is more centrally governed than locally, meaning that my central nervous system is deciding what I do and don't do, not my local muscular system, which if we're looking at from a stress response, we typically look at the muscle out as like where the outcome measure is, where Noakes would say that's, we can make the decision at any point to do more, right? The the woman lifting a car off her child or a marathoner having someone 10 feet in front of them, but they're completely physically exhausted. They can't finish, gets a late second kick and they finish the race. So like whatever external driver can overcome whatever internal environment, but that notion there, that's a, I think it's a really interesting thought. And I think we see it all the time. I'm not banking on, can I artificially create an external environment for that person to overcome whatever intrinsic physiology they do or don't have. I want to put them in a position to be as successful as possible from managing my workloads, my work to rest ratio within a tra training session and with in between training sessions, as well as giving them the right fuel and nutrition from a carbohydrate and protein perspective to have as much high performing anaerobic glycolysis during a workout. If that in fact is the goal. And that's the, that, I think that's the part that as I'm thinking about this out loud and going through this process, it's going to fall into just have a two to one carb protein blend before you work out. That's pretty much what's going to fall into. But the other note, it's we need to get back down to understanding what the goal is and, and almost detaching from your own personal goal or other things that you may have heard because bioenergetics and biochemistry are always going to be the foundation of this. And it's okay to do a thought experiment of what if I'm at university of Wisconsin and I met the strength coach there. He's a, amazing guy. I told him how envious we've all been over our entire careers of having 350 pound linemen, basically glorified sumo wrestlers and just pounding defensive linemen for, for 60 minutes and going like, imagine if we just get them stronger, just basically like road graders, right? If a bulldozer of a kid and just turning them into a, a mauler, like how fun that would be. 
um, versus like, ah, you know, they got to get them. I got to get a six foot seven kid who's 220 pounds that was playing backup center and tight end to get them to 340 pounds and be able to move well, like in six months, like that sucks. That's hard. You know, or, or I got to get 30 pounds off a kid because he can't, he can't touch the ground with his hand because he can't get in a three point stance. Like that sucks. That's hard yeah, versus fun. like bigger's better. You know, that <laughs> makes such a blast. But if I had a situation like that <laughs> and the other guy is just an absolute gem of a human, Ben Herbert now with the chargers had a great sound bite. He's like, and just the most intense, uh, I don't care about anything, but body comp, like it was so great, but they were going to, they, someone put the, uh, the Deion Sanders coach prime, you know, the, what makes you think you can break me? You did not make me but like, dun, dun, like that, like dramatic music around background. It's so good. But that element of looking at this and saying, Hey, I just want to get this person strong, right? I'm at West side barbell. I am the, the, the nutritionist for them. And Louis just says, get them strong. I don't care. And I'm like, all right, cool. Let's make sure we get the right amount of glucose and and amino acids and protein before they work out. So they have enough bandwidth from a anaerobic glycolysis perspective to execute the task. Simple as that. And then it's like, oh man, they got to prove the body comp. Okay. It's a different conversation. It might still look very similar. And that's hopefully what the value of a good sports nutrition program is. It doesn't look violently different. It just more specific to their goal. I think that's the part that gets into it and how so easy to overlook the slight nuance you're creating that makes it feel seamless and integrated into that. And, you know, that's the part that as you started to break down good sports nutrition and what a good coach does that in that role, it, they don't make anyone ever feel excluded or isolated. They always can tie in what that person's individual needs into the, the needs of the workout and the overall plan. So we got into pre pre-nutrition there. What about intra and post? Or is, what can our strategies be for, for those things to make sure we're, we're staying on the right track and sort of avoiding that uh, de deleterious effects from the governor? Man, del deleterious, man. We never want those. I had to, uh, I had to dig deep for that one. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a good one, man. It's one of those ones you got to think about how you're going to say it before you say it too. Do you, how, do you accentuate the del, deleterious, you know, yeah. the, how, or how do you say deleterious? it? There's so many yeah. things that go into yeah. it. Yeah. O old English pronunciation. Yeah. And I'm with that. So with that being said, there's a, a lot of research on high volume or long duration exercise and carbohydrate ingestion, right? So distance athletes, endurance athletes, a lot of what we do is based off of that research, right? The problem is one, we're not having that much expenditure. And then two, we're not going that duration, right? So if an athlete's taking in 15 grams of carbohydrates for every 30 minutes and then 30 grams of carbohydrates for every 60 minutes and they're doing three hours, some cases they're doing ultra marathons, which are uh, lasting like 12 to 16 hours. Yeah, that's a different conversation than doing a 60 minute workout with 20 total yeah. sets, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that's the. I think that's the part that gets a little like kind of dicey, right? And then there's the, in what world are, are we ever working with that a kid can just sit down and enjoy a delicious carbohydrate electrolyte blend in the middle of the workout? Like I just, you know, like that part is like also the more hysterical <laughs> part. Yeah, like go get your delicious treat over there without getting made fun of too, right? Like make sure you're yeah. enjoying some delicious snacks in between uh, your set six and eight over there, you know? Some um, more slices of that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not halftime of a Pop Warner football game. So there's that element, but you know, it gets to do a lot of different things. And I would say above all else, if we're good on the front end, it lowers the burden within the workout, right? So good pre-workout nutrition, that, third, that, that two to one carbohydrate to protein blend to come in the form of a simple sugar mix, like a quad carb or a pentacarb mixed with a little bit of whey protein. Some people don't tolerate whey protein, but then there's also the amino acid quality within a plant-based protein or beef isolate protein, just simply whey's king. Never do casein, by the way. Like, casein's a joke. Like, 
if anyone just listens to this and go, oh, I like Casey, what you thought of it? It's a joke. You know nothing what you're talking about. Anyone tells me different. Anyone says it's good is a liar or they just don't know what they're talking about. And I know people who are really, quote, unquote, smart says it's not that bad. But the same people say cook in a microwave and take aspartame. You'll be fine. Like, sure. Yeah. Okay. That's a good idea. Come on, man. Right. If we don't draw the line somewhere, you know, don't, don't. Don't undemonize aspartame and microwaves because like, I've worked too damn hard to make sure those are wrong, and I'm I'm stuck in that right. But it's also a slippery slope. Like you're willing to microwave your food and suck down aspartame and drink casein, why not just why not just smoke cigarettes and do hardcore drugs and just become a complete loser? You know, uh, so. So the, the notion, though, of a carbohydrate protein blend beforehand, something that's tolerated, something that's simple sugars. Now, what will happen, this is interesting, you're going to have an insulin bump, right? So when insulin's released, we are hopefully going into what we call an anabolic state. So we're trying to build glycogen. We're trying to go through mTOR pathways. Insulin drops. Blood glucose drops. So you might feel hungry midway through the workout. And what's interesting is people that are more insulin sensitive. So if you have a really high simple sugar, uh, what they call very high glycemic load or insulinic load before the workout might feel depleted energy wise during the workout. So that why some people that, hey, get a meal before an hour before you work out with a little bit more complex, lower glycemic carbs, not high fiber because fiber is kind of the, the enemy of exercise. It's the greatest yeah. thing in the world. And it's a simple lowest hanging fruit to improve health for everybody. Not around your workouts. Not around the Fat workout. and fiber around your workouts, no bueno, right? We are, mm -hmm. it, it is a intentionally slow digestion to slow down insulin release. So that's a problem. You usually get more of a bowel movement occurring not too far afterwards, especially if you're eating fiber recurrently, which is good, not a bad thing. It has, it's broken down in the large intestines or the colon based off of bacteria, not necessarily through this process of breaking down sugars from like amylase in the mouth and then going through what is it proteolase enzymes or enzymes within the small intestine to break down disaccharides monosaccharides even polysaccharides as well starches in that small intestine to create energy so we're thinking in that notion of you can get out there an hour before now here's the issue and this is something that i think is critical most people are working out before big meals. We're working out before the morning, before breakfast, and then we're working out in that window where you're normally eating dinner, and we have to accommodate dinner around that. And if you're gonna pull 10 people, I guarantee nine people are saying, I'd rather just have dinner after my workout at night than, <clears throat> than have an early dinner an hour or two hours before my workout and then go work out. And I think that's just the truth of the matter is. So if we're trying to get people to eat a more balanced meal with with more polysaccharides or complex carbohydrates that break down a little bit slower an hour to 90 minutes before their workout with a lower protein or lower fat protein, like a lean chicken breast or egg whites or something of that nature, good luck to get someone to do that at 4 a.m. or 4 p.m. So I think that's the – I think that's kind of the thought of – pre-workout shakes, a carbohydrate protein blend, and knowing that whey protein has a little bit more of an insulinic load that might have an impact there, knowing that simple sugars or quadricarb or pentacarb blend might actually have an impact on their, their insulin load. But then we can match that with amino acids during the workout. And then we start getting into the, we can preserve glucose and glycogen longer if we have amino acid blends, specifically uh, essential amino acids, which is all the essential amino acids, but the specific ones are going to be leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And those are the branch chain amino acids, which during the workout will preserve glucose and glycogen longer. The other one is glutamine. And glutamine is actually the second most utilized amino acid during exercise. So if I have my branch chains and my glutamine, which is why I just take it in the form of an essential amino acid because it's all right there. We can preserve glucose longer and we can preserve glycogen longer. So we should, in theory, have more capacity later. And that's when we get into that, that final phase, whether I'm doing, let's just say, eight sets, the fourth quarter of that set seven and eight, or the 
third to fourth part of the workout where they're moving to the B and the C series, all of that is preserved longer and we get better output, which if I'm trying to get stronger and have the more foundational material, now I go through anaerobic glycolysis a little bit more efficiently. And then I would throw creatine in there as well, which creatine is one of those ones that the more and more we find about it, the more value we find with it, but the less and less structure we need with it. It is not going to have a stimulatory effect before you work out. It probably doesn't necessarily matter when you dose it. As long as I think of like creatine as a multivitamin now, as long as we're taking it, we're good. Five grams a day universally get into this like dynamic of, I just take it during my workout. And I think that's probably the easiest way to think about it. Cause you're usually blending it with some sort of amino blend that it makes creatine a little bit more palatable and, you know, get the, the effects from it. But all that being considered is all right. Now we're thinking of this from an anaerobic glycolysis standpoint. We have carbs, we have amino acids, we have creatine phosphate, which is a peptide circulating. And when it really gets to the point where we're making this neuromuscular or muscular adaptations to improve more, improve more force, we have all the things in place nutritionally to make sure we get the job done. Yeah, that was awesome, Tim. We got deep, deep into it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Get it out. We yeah, got get deep on nutrition, how to support glycolysis there and how to get stronger. So thank you. This is great. Yeah. Yeah, man. And remember, aspartame, bad, casein, bad, microwaves, bad. Never use Anyone that tells you differently is an idiot. absolute idiot. They're an idiot. He just wants you to like, do cocaine. You can forward this to them and they could have a, you know, grill the guru, tell me what's what. Like, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. Yeah, like, you're, you're either doing and sumo you, deadlift you or using a microwave that. or you're training correctly and not using a microwave. That's pretty much the two Easy. camps here. There's good and bad, you know. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. There's If you're sumo deadlifting and using microwaves, I have no respect for you. None. <laughs> none. Zero. None. 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 There's no way around it. So, and you so can say, hey, it. Tim, what do you know about nutrition? You're right. You're right. But I know that I'm not using a microwave and not sumo deadlifting. So by default, therefore, I'm better, right? So. Yeah. It's easy. That's it, man. The harder right over the easier wrong. That's what I tell people. Eat your food cold and bring your feet in yeah. and do deadlifts like correctly. Yeah. Exactly. So exactly. easy. Oh, your the barbells below your shoulder blades on your squat. That seems wrong. Why don't you go heat up your your white rice and lean chicken breast and in, in the microwave there? Because what you just basically lost all self respect for your like you know like you just you give it up. All right, man. Thank you so much. See you, Tim. See you, buddy.